and I am the provost of Oaks College now. <laughs> this house is a magical place. That was obvious the week I moved in and took in the beauty and splendor of the surroundings. It was obvious when we had visits from great horned owls, hawks, and other majestic creatures. For me, it has been a place of careful planning, scheming, conspiring, truth-telling, solace and where I can have where I have done some of my most impassioned writing and thinking I call on the lingering memories of Dr. Blake Howard Thurman Septimal Clark and others who have graced the hallowed grounds of Oaks College it gives me great pleasure to be the provost who is living in the house when this momentous change is taking place I think it is not a coincidence that my partner and I are both alumni of UC Santa Cruz, both transfer students, both first generation college students, both faced housing insecurity when growing up, both doing what we can to make this world a better place for those whose hopes and dreams have had to grow through cracks in the concrete. I will say more about Dr. Blake and his legacy during the formal program. So now without further ado, Let's hear a few words from Dr. Blake, and then we will jointly unveil the sign. Thank you, Provost uh, Langenhout. I, I can't tell you how thrilling it is to see this assembly, to join Emily Moore, Audris Blake, and Vanessa Blake and myself in this ceremony. This house is an important place. It is a place where I was inspired by memories of my mother, whose favorite flowers grew wild in the canyon behind. It's a place where I was moved by the beauty of sitting here and looking out and writing about the extraordinary opportunity we had to build this college. But it is also a place where we're able to offer comfort to students. I could tell story after story after story, but even though I have another chance, I do want to share one about this house. At the time, my wife and I kept a frozen casserole always in the house in the event we had an opportunity to host someone under unusual circumstances. And one time we had two students, both sisters, whose mother died and they had no relatives here. They were living in the residence hall. They were from San Jose. 
and they received word that their mother had died and there was no next of kin anywhere in this county or the nearby region. <coughs> the students didn't know what to do knowing that their colleagues and companions mother had died and they didn't know what to do. When we got word we went right over there picked them up, brought them here, put them in the guest room, and kept them here until we had resolved all of the issues and next of kin came and got them. Death could not be delegated to staff. And we took on that responsibility of serving. Had nothing to do necessarily with being an academic or anything, but it had everything to do with being a human. And that's what this house represents to me, the human qualities of all of us. And so many of you worked on this house, worked in this house, and I am privileged, really privileged, to have this opportunity to say just a few moments of thank you and gratitude, profound gratitude. Thank you, thank you. I know this is a very exciting time. For me, this is almost as exciting as commencement, and that is saying something because that is my favorite thing. <laughs> so welcome, honored guests, Chancellor, Dr. Moore, and of course, Dr. Blake. For those of you who are returning from a long hiatus, welcome back. Welcome back to one of your homes. I would like to acknowledge and honor the fact that we are gathering today on the lands of the Amamutsan Tribal Band of Ohlone Indians, who are the original inhabitants of Santa Cruz. My name is Gina Langhout. I am the Provost of Oaks College. It is truly wonderful to see so many of you here to mark the renaming of the Oaks Provost House, the J. Herman Blake Provost House. I know that this turnout is so amazing because Dr. Blake is such an inspiring visionary. We are so lucky that he was the founding provost of Oaks College and that he, along with Dr. Ralph Guzman, set the direction of the college. We have done our best to stay focused on our mission, which is to understand human diversity as an exceptional strength from which to engage in intellectual, academic, and personal inquiry. We do this to affect positive social and political change. We carry Dr. Blake's legacy forward in many ways at Oaks College today, and I want to briefly highlight three this evening. First, Dr. Blake and the founding fellows built a college where one intellectual pillar was communication and solidarity across social groups, be it gender, race, ethnicity, class, sexuality, and so on. The Oaks Core Course, Communicating Diversity for a Just Society, is a foundational way we uphold this pillar. Students talk about learning their own history, others' histories, and how systems and structures affect them, as well as how to resist unjust systems and restructure them for freedom. For many Oaks students, the core course is what they name as their most important and meaningful class in their entire time at UC Santa Cruz. The first version of this class, before it was the core course, was conceptualized and taught by Dr. Blake. Students demanded it become required for all Oaks students because they saw the value and importance of the class for their lives at that time and for their futures. So thank you for that, Dr. Blake. Second, Dr. Blake and the founding fellows were committed to ensuring that the sciences were a possibility for all students who were interested in pursuing them, which meant supporting students of color, women, and first-generation college students who did not feel welcome in the sciences. 
Today, to meet these goals, our programming includes the College Math Academy, which is a 40-person pre-calculus class that ties math to the Oaks theme and extends the Oaks living and learning community for another quarter. We chose pre-calculus because it has been a gateway class that serves as a barrier for STEM-intended majors. Professor Nandini expertly supports, so expertly and supportively teaches the class and gets amazing results. Thank you, Professor Nandini. To support students in STEM, we also have our Oak scientist in residence, Adriana Lopez, who lives in Bico House and is a PhD student in molecular, cellular, and developmental biology. She provides regular programming to Oak students including helping students with fellowship and scholarship applications, teaching them how to get into a lab, and organizing dinners at the J. Herman Blake Provost House, hosted by me, with a STEM faculty member or Oaks alum as a guest. They talk about their career trajectory, a major challenge they have overcome, and their research over dinner with seven students. Thank you for your dedication and energy, Adriana. Where did, oh, there you are. Third, and finally, Dr. Blake was committed to community engagement, which included partnerships in the island off of South Carolina, the Central Valley of California, and the East Bay. We continue to be committed to community engagement, and today we have the Oaks CARA program, which stands for Community-Based Action Research and Advocacy. Students gain experience with research and advocacy from a critical and social transformation framework. They might be applying this framework to schools, the rental market in town, circuits of communication at Oaks, or more. In all cases, they work to expand justice. They can graduate with a CARA certificate as well. The program is under our CARA director, Dr. Leslie Lopez, who is one of the most committed and impassioned people I know. You will be hearing more from Dr. Lopez later, so thank you, Leslie, for your vision and commitment. Not sure where Leslie. Oh, Thank you. The renaming of the Provost House will remind all of us of our legacy and to live our legacy. So thank you, Dr. Blake, for what you have taught me and for what you have made possible at Oaks. I'm forever grateful for your leadership, vision, and creativity in making Oaks a reality. I'm extremely happy to introduce Professor Emeritus Bill Doyle, who spent some of his youth in Watsonville and graduated from high school there. Dr. Doyle was a founding faculty member of UC Santa Cruz and a founding fellow of Oaks College. He was also a professor of biology, a deputy provost and acting provost of Oaks College, a dean of the Natural Sciences Division, and director of the Institute for Marine Sciences. Professor Doyle was a central founding faculty member of Oaks in that he was the first white faculty member to show up to engage this important project of solidarity work across social groups as it related to freedom and liberation, but especially on the topic of racial justice and science. Professor Doyle will speak on the founding of Oaks College. So please join me in welcoming him. Just mentally, not physically. I would like to talk about the two individuals, J. Herman Blake and Raphael or Ralph Guzman, who actually founded Oaks College by their joint efforts as well as individually. And I don't have a big story, I don't want to take too long. So I will go over rather quickly how and why these two individuals accomplished so much for the future. Herman Blake showed up at, at Santa Cruz in 1966. He was a fellow of Oaks College and a acting assistant professor of sociology. And that's because his PhD degree had not yet been finished. So they put acting in front of those instead of real. <clears throat> 
The next year, 1967, Dean McHenry, Chancellor, asked Herman if he would chair an Ethnic Studies Committee. It turns out that the Ethnic Studies Committee had a number of people of one. <laughs> it, it was charged to evaluate hiring and uh, availability of faculty members and students of non-traditional backgrounds <clears throat> and, to make and to meet with college provosts, board chairs, and deans of the various divisions to talk about the need to look for faculty and staff of ethnic minority underrepresented backgrounds. And that kept him busy. And the, and the next year, in 1967, 1968, he also was asked to be to chair the Ethnic Studies Committee with the faculty of a, a, a committee of one <clears throat> to continue this sort of activity. But I remember I was a member of Cal College. I remember Herman talking at some of the Cal College meetings and being very much impressed with what he had to say, the approach, and the importance, not to Cal, but to the university and to society in general, of thinking beyond what the theme of a college, like Western civilization for Cal College, how can you diversify? He had very many times th important things to say. And <clears throat> So we had a little interaction, but not a whole lot. The other time I had a chance to interact with Herman briefly was that I would occasionally, after uh, <clears throat> doing things, head down to the field house to look for a pickup game of basketball. And before I entered the field house, here was a young man out there punching away on a punching bag. It happened to be Herman Blake. He was incredible, talented. He could even do the punching bags with his elbows. <laughs> And, and I'm not kidding. It was a fantastic amount of uh, activity and ability. I did think I should never cr cross paths, make him <laughs> upset with me <laughs> on that. <clears throat> so for the two years of 1967, 68, 68, 69, Herman was the uh, uh, sole person who would go to various communities in the Central Valley and Riverside County and Riverside and other places, meet with, uh, meet with staff of schools and people and clubs to talk about the opportunities at Oaks College, but also to find out what they felt the needs were in their area. And also, uh, many of them <clears throat> would talk about the needs, their their children, and they'd like to have more people come back into their community as, quote, role models in medicine, um, mathematics, various prof professions. To move on now, the next, in uh, 1969 um, at 70, that academic year, a person by the name of Raphael, or Ralph Guzman, and the accent is on the man, it's Guzman, not Guzman, uh, <clears throat> was hired by UCSC as an acting associate professor of politics and a member of Merrill College. A letter from the chancellor asked Ralph and Herman to be co-members joint members of an ethnic studies committee, now of two members. <laughs> and he also was asked to be the co-chair of the ethnic studies committee for the following year in 7071, with the same general charge of uh, making recommendations to the various disciplines and others about possible faculty and, and uh, <clears throat> staff that could be brought into the, the, uh, the Santa Cruz campus of the university. In addition to spending a considerable amount of time, the two of them, trying to diversify the faculty and staff uh, on the campus, they also initiated discussions of the potential for College 7 of having 
a little bit a different viewpoint of things. And I remember talking with Herman fairly recently that uh, Herman and family lived in Santa Cruz, but Ralph and family lived in um, Bonny Doon, up in the rural area. And uh, Herman would talk about the important time that he spent in Bonny Doon talking with Ralph in the quietness and the ability to c carry through conversations and think together. And he said he and Ralph got along exceptionally well in terms of their viewpoint of what College 7 could become. And one of the things that they really were interested in is the diversity within the student body. In particular, what they're interested in is not developing a college, a black studies college, or a Chicano studies college, or whatever. They're interested in developing a multi-ethnic or multi-racial, multicultural type of a college that cuts across lines and looked at the diversity with a viewpoint of coming together, understanding each other. Because they all, all of these ethnic groups, people in there, they have similar loves, thoughts, ideas. But it's a tendency and need to have a diversity in a supportive environment that uh, look for help to get away from what I would think rather more narrow, a black studies curriculum with a BA, MA, and a PhD, or a Chicano studies in those areas, because that has a tendency to really compartmentalize. They were interested in developing interactions. <clears throat> in, um, Sorry, uh, I hate to admit it, but age, that's my excuse, is, <laughs> does make a difference. Um, okay, in a letter to both Herman and Ralph of September 31st of 1971, Dean McHenry asked Ralph and Herman, and this is to quote, to serve as members of of an executive committee to plan and organize College 7, which will be launched in 1972. So here's official documentation of the two of them working together to develop the program for College 7. Continue the quote, the committee is asked to function in lieu of a provost, but the committee will have all the authority of the provost ship until such time as a provost is appointed. So now this opportunity is, a, is official documentation of the co-working together, co-founding, and be careful with that co-founding. It's not confounding. <laughs> but very quickly, since this was in the uh, September of 1971, the college was to open in the fall of 1972. They had a lot of work to do. So they immediately erected, the two of them, committees, planning committees. And one of the planning committees <clears throat> worked on identifying faculty and staff who would be then requested to come into Oaks College. And thank good Lord. I was one of the mem members to have been asked to come into Oaks College and uh, uh, not only just for Herman, but for the staff, faculty, and students that have been attracted. A tremendous impact on my life. And then in addition to a faculty planning committee, there is also one that composed primarily of students. And they looked at the pos uh, of the housing and positions of housing, dormitories versus apartments, these sorts of things, and to provide information. <clears throat> and and uh, it was a very active time. And also during this early period of time, 
we uh, began the discussion of a type of a, a science program within the college. And um, I, I won't go into that, but again, that it, it comes from Herman and Ralph working together exceptionally. Then in April of 1972, Chancellor McHenry informed Herman and Ralph that uh, the UC president, Office of the President, and the UC Board of Regents have approved the appointment of Herman as acting provost, and again acting because the PhD <laughs> dissertation had not been uh, uh, submitted but acting provost of College 7, effective July 1st of 1972. That's when the campus was, uh, college was opening. And soon after that, Ralph decided and returned to Merrill College. Now I was taken back by that because I didn't tell you. When I had that meeting with Ralph and Herman when they asked me to join the college, I had a chance to listen to the two of them interact and then look at me. Yeah, I had a marvelous chance to look at the people as people and how they got along together. But also, I was so impressed that, yes, I was going to come in. But I did talk to my wife first, which we often do. <clears throat> but Merrill returned, uh, uh, Ralph returned to Merrill College. I was very concerned because I was unaware of that might happen. I talked to, to Ralph, and among the things he said was that he now has a lot of other things that he would like to do, and this would give him time to do it. Kind of unsaid, but comes out of it, he also felt that a co-provostship could lead to some factions pushing him versus pushing Ralph to do different things and put them in tight positions or even disrupt the interaction of collegiate uh, students. In talking to Herman, he also said that Ralph had written him a note expressing support of Herman and activities in Oaks College. He didn't back out because he was mad at Herman or the college. And that let him know how he might help. I would like to point out in support of that statement as well, is that the first full graduating class of Oaks College, Ralph Guzman, was the graduation speaker celebration. And he did a marvelous job. So I just wanted, I'll end at this point, it's more than 10 minutes, I'm sure. Um, Wanting to be sure that you understand that, in fact, Oaks College was founded by these two individuals working together, discussing differences of opinion, and then coming together and supporting each other throughout their lives. So I think uh, Herman, I can't, uh, oh, oh, I should make one other comment. Here in this building, there is a room that was endowed by Oaks College students and others, ex-students, that bears Ralph Guzman's name. And I don't remember the name of the, of the room, but uh, I mean the, the number as well. But again, uh, because of his early influence, memory is very important. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Doyle. The Guzman room is actually right under us right now, so it's like um, Professor Guzman's uh, spirit is with us here today as well. So I am delighted to introduce Chancellor George Blumenthal. Chancellor Blumenthal came to UC Santa Cruz in 1972 and is also a professor of astronomy and astrophysics. He is the first in his family to graduate from college. He is another founding fellow of Oaks College, and he attends one of our science dinners as a guest of honor every year. The students and I have enjoyed getting to know the chancellor in a more personal venue. You may know that he recently announced his retirement, effective at the end of this academic year. He will have been chancellor for 13 years. 
He will talk about his early days at Oaks. Please join me in welcoming the Chancellor. Thank you so much, Gina. As Gina said, I arrived at uh, UCSC in the spring of 1972. And um, the then Dean, I guess Vice Chancellor of Sciences, Matt Sands, arranged for me to meet with both Bill Doyle and with uh, Herman Blake and uh, Ralph Guzman. And those meetings took place. I, I was struck when I met with Ralph and Herman, just as, just as Bill described it, how well they played off each other at the vision that they had for the college, I was, I was entranced at the notion of a multi multicultural college with, which was multi-ethnic, where people were encouraged to celebrate their differences and where there was also to be academic rigor and a strong science program because Herman was absolutely convinced that he wanted students from all backgrounds to have access to every single major, including the sciences. And so that was an important part of, uh, of the vision for the college. So I, I happily agreed to join Oaks College and I was there when it opened in the fall of 1972. And it was an exciting time, it really was. The cast of characters in those early years was amazing. There were people who were so committed to, to that vision. I can't possibly name them all, but I want to name a few. There was Victor Rocha in, in biology, who was, was really a, a kind of one, of the, one of the active movers in, in the early science program. There was Eduardo Carrillo in, in the arts. And Herman once said to me, I think, I, I think he even said it publicly, that the reason he started Oaks College was just so that he could hire Eduardo Carrillo. <laughs> Because Eduardo was a fantastic person and, and a fantastic contrib contributor. There was Roberto Crespi, who was in many ways part of the conscious of, conscience of Oaks College, uh, who, who, who pushed us all in, in many ways, and we needed that. But what was so exciting was that the, the faculty were young, and they were energetic, and they were committed. And then and more and more faculty over the years joined, and Ron Softley as well joined the, the college and, and served an important role in keeping us on track, helping raise money, and um, really kind of person to bounce ideas off of along the way. Uh, and so many people came and, 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 and contributed. For me personally, it was exciting. And I had an interesting experience with Herman. Herman had a, had a policy. Uh, and, and during his provost years, that he would go visit every faculty member every year in their office to talk about what they did, not just for the college, but what they did for the university. And so he came to visit me during that first year uh, that I was in the college over in Natsai II where my office was, and he wanted to know what I did, and we had a very pleasant conversation. And he kept saying, well, what do you think? You know, what do you think of the university? What do you think of the college? And you have, to, you have to understand, I was young. I was like 25 years old when I came here. I had a long beard. I was very shy and retiring. Uh, so for me to speak up was a big deal. Um, and um, you wouldn't know that now, but uh, it was true in those days. And um, so I, I finally said to him, you know, Herman, some things just don't make sense to me. It doesn't make sense to me that we're at a major university and we have two parallel structures. I serve on the same committee in my department, which we used to call boards, and, and in the college. Uh, we're building a college which is so exciting, but it's the junior faculty who are doing, doing the work. We really need to think carefully about, um, you know, what, how, prioritizing what we do and uh, moving forward. And Herman was ever the gentleman. He thanked me profusely for uh, being honest and frank with him about some of my concerns. Uh, he was very nice about it. And you know, the meeting ended and he went off. And then the next day he called me up and he said he'd been thinking about our conversation the previous day. And so he wanted to invite me to join the executive committee of the college. <laughs> and of course I said yes. And I am so glad that I said yes, because I served for two or three years on the executive committee of Oaks College. And for me, that was a transformative experience. It was transformative because I got to see firsthand Herman's leadership style. I learned so much from that man. I can't even begin to tell you how much I learned from Herman Blake. Um, I got to understand some of the inner workings of the university in ways that I would never have otherwise come to understand. I got to know people, some of the amazing people who served with me 
on the executive committee, committee. And by the way, I think it was interesting. We The executive committee didn't meet on campus. We met in the evenings, and we met at the house of one of our faculty, Diane Lewis. And the reason we met at her house was because she was a single mom, and it was a real difficulty for her to leave her child. So we said, well, the, we'll come to you. And I just thought that was so cool that we could do that. And it was, a, it was for me, a great experience. I never for one minute regretted taking that on. So these were exciting times. We were putting together a core course for the college. We were putting together a science program. Uh, and Herman's leadership during that period was essential because most of us didn't have any idea what we were doing, but Herman did. And, um, and Herman led both you know, uh, academically, but also ethically, um, and uh, in, in other ways as well. I, I don't know how many of you know this, but in those days, Herman was a runner, and he would run marathons. And so he was a great role model to making sure that we, we actually took care of ourselves, our, our bodies, as, as, we, as we worked so very hard. And, and Herman actually did run in marathons in those days. So um, uh, it was a great experience. Uh, and ultimately, within a few years, excuse me, Herman and Ron, through their fundraising, were able to raise some money so that the college could be endowed and the provost house, the J. Herman Blake house, could be built and the science center could be built. And um, there's an interesting little footnote to that story uh, in that I heard at the time that Herman had been offered a gift, an endowment from a different source prior to the Oaks gift, but that he had turned it down because he did not want the name associated with that gift to be associated with, with our college here. And I, re I reminded Herman of that some months ago when he and I saw each other. And I said, well, you, you know, you never told us who that was. And he said, yeah, and I'm not going to tell you now. <laughs> So we did get the gift from, from, from the, you know, the Oaks gift, which I think came from the San Francisco Foundation. It allowed us to build this building. It allowed us to build the J. Herman Blake House. And, um, uh, and, and to build this building, Herman thought a lot about what this would be. This was originally the Science Center at Oaks College. So Herman asked Bill Doyle and me to accompany him to uh, North Carolina to visit a university there that had a unique way, an idea of how to uh, um, build a science laboratory, which I found really exciting, although I'm not a laboratory scientist, so I wasn't necessarily the best choice for that, but, but Bill was, so I trusted him. In any event, uh, um, uh, we, we did go on that trip. For me, that was a life-changing experience. Yes, it was in interesting. Uh, we did, in fact, uh, uh, choose to emulate uh, uh, the laboratory that we saw, and that's what, why this building was built the way it was. But it was also interesting to me because I got an opportunity to meet Herman's father, who I found to be an exceptionally interesting man. And then Herman honored us both by having us join him and a few students who had been working with Herman as well on Defusky Island, where Herman had a house and where he did his research. I don't know how many of you know about Defusky Island. It's an island which was a stopping point for the slave trade prior to the Civil War. And the people who in those days lived on Defusky Island uh, were the descendants of the people who had been left there. It was an interesting and somewhat isolated society. And that's what Herman studied. And he, and he didn't, you know, there, wasn't, there were no hotels. I mean, there was a dirt road down the middle of the island. And, um, and so Herman had us all stay with local residents. I remember I stayed with Miss Hamilton, and who was just a very nice lady. And we had a wonderful time. It really gave us an understanding of who Herman Blake is and the kind of things that he does, did for his own research, and how respected he was by the people on that island. Now, I've not been back myself to Defusky, partly because uh, Herman has told me since about the developments and, and the changes on the island. For me, it would be too emotionally negative an experience to go back and see those changes. But, um, but I, I just... For me, that was, again, a life-changing experience. And I know that it was true for others who Herman took with him there. Oaks College thrived in those days. The science program thrived. The core course thrived. And um, uh, I think this really was a tribute to who, who was our leader and who had the academic vision and really the leadership vision to make this place a success. So um, Herman, I, I just want to salute you one more time and tell you how 
totally pleased I am that um, we've we've done this naming. I think J. Herman Blake House is the exact right name for that Provost House. Thank you. I am thrilled to introduce Ms. Audris Blake. Ms. Blake is Assistant Director of the Center for Agroecology and Sustainable Food Systems. She is also Dr. Blake's daughter. In my time as provost, I have had the good fortune of getting to know Ms. Blake. She has been a critical friend, confidant, and important thought partner while I have been provost, offering me support and encouragement at the exact moments when I have needed it. This evening, Ms. Blake will share some early memories of the Provost House. Please join me in welcoming Audrey Blake. While Dr. Blumenthal remembered this place as the Science Center, I remembered it as lights low in a dance place for <laughs> students to learn salsa, which was pretty fun. Although I wasn't supposed to be here. <laughs> in the midst of the openness, there came ideas of where people could come from all walks of life to learn, learn how to be, thrive, and grow. It was within an oak grove that ideas at all stages of development, like acorns, strong and nutritive, came to life. It's not easy to imagine that a building would foster the way in which people would find themselves. Young people, confident externally, yet frightened within by the oddity of higher education, would come to the building and be buoyed by, buoyed by the belief that dad had, that they would come, become more than they had imagined. If only they would take the time to imagine, to work hard, and seek out those who were invested in their success. If only they would, they could make it. They could learn amidst the hardships that came with being in a new environment, a new way of being far, far away from home. The building was not only there for those young people, no, People seasoned with the passing of time came and served as mentors, helpers, sages to mingle with the young, offering wisdom that scattered like acorns fallen under the trees would take root. Wisdom that appeared to be hidden under leaves. Wisdom that at times seemed to be crushed so that new life could emerge, new ideas could take root. It was in this context of being that the Oaks Provost House offered a place of solace, of nourishment with the many meals that were served, that people came and found within that building a community. There they could come to learn that I'm okay to be here because there were people who poured caring and belief into their questioning. It was within the building that dreams came alive. Students who were without access because they were unaware that they belonged and that education belonged to them found that they too could dream and dream they did. It was within the building that dreams were created, where educational goals and institutional understanding was shaped, thrown away, and then reshaped again. For to have the programming just right required risk. That risk was only taken because of the dreams of having a college that became oaks were dreamt and came to reality. It was within the building that I, as a young woman, learned how to grow, to learn, to approach the idea of what it would take to be, to dream. It was a place where questions were not always answered. It was a place where the hubbub of activity was sometimes louder than I wanted. But little did I know that in the midst of it all, I too would find more 
within the building that I imagined. Looking back at the building, at my time of adolescence and a desire to reach out beyond what was possible, has been filled with many memories. I spoke about this building here and the dances that took place. I never understood why I couldn't attract the attention of young men that I would look after, <laughs> not understanding that my father was a, a barrier. <laughs> a big barrier. It was within that building that I learned what it took to sacrifice what may have been wanted to serve the greater good, for the lives that were touched were changed forever. Dreams can only take place when sacrifices are embraced. And there were many sacrifices that occurred. But I will tell you, each sacrifice, while not always fond in memory, is celebrated now because of the many lives that have been transformed. Generational poverty has been broken. People have gone forward into their lives that they never imagined would be possible because they never would have been the same had it not been for what took place in that house. And really, what took place in that house was my father. It is my pleasure to introduce Mr. Donai Welda Gabriel. Mr. Welda Gabriel graduated from Oaks College in June 2018 with a degree in computer science. He is now a STEM counselor through the Campus Educational Opportunities Program. Mr. Welda Gabriel came to my attention a few years ago when he wanted to talk with me about how his tech ideas could help Oaks students. Then he came to talk with me again after setting up a mentoring program for students who were part of the Black Student Union at Santa Cruz High School. We figured out a way for him to take the BSU students and their UCSC mentors to a conference at Stanford. Mr. Welda Gabriel will speak today about how Dr. Blake and the Oaks legacy has influenced his own community engagement. Welcome, Denai. Hello, um, okay. So hello and welcome everyone to this historic day for the J. Herman Blake Provost House renaming. I would like to start off by saying Oaks. Oaks. All right, um, I'm truly honored to be able to stand here in front of you all and witness the well-deserving recognition and acknowledgement for Dr. Drake. I mean, <laughs> I'm kind of nervous, I'm not gonna lie. My heart is pounding. <laughs> So I'm gonna start that over, okay? I'm truly honored to be able to stand here in front of you all and witness the well-deserving recognition and acknowledgement for Dr. Herman Blake. Oaks has always given me a, a sense of belonging and community. To this day, my lifelong friends have been other Oaks students. The biggest thing I learned at Oaks was how to create and be in a community. I learned how to understand people and how to really connect with them. Plus, it has a beautiful view you, which you can't see, um, and it gave me a mental peace while in school. Last year, thanks to Professor Melvin Cox, I was able to attend the 2017 Founder Celebration. That was the first time I met Dr. Blake, where he received the Fiat Lux Award. Hearing his story that evening really inspired me to be more and to do more. The exposure I got that night, combined with what I learned here at Oaks, helped me to think even further outside the box. I began to think of ways I could get involved with the community. I used to always think, oh, I'm gonna help once I'm back in the Bay. But Oaks is also my community and community, and over time I realized Santa Cruz is also my community and it is my responsibility to be a part of it. That's when I reached out to the Black Student Union at Santa Cruz High and established a mentorship program that connected college students with high school students. This program was focused mainly around bringing the distant community together and creating, and creating a support system, whether it be social, emotional, or academic support. 
Now I'm working as an EOP STEM counselor, serving the greater community of UCSC students, pursuing a degree in science, technology, engineering, and math. I bring Dr. Blake's legacy to that work every day by showing up and doing my best to relate and connect with students. And lastly, I would like to thank to, th to thank Dr. Regina Langhout for presenting me with this opportunity. I did not expect this, but thank you all for having me. Um, yeah, um, thank you. Thank you. I'm excited to introduce Professor Leslie Lopez, who is the director of the Oaks CARA program, which began in 2012. CARA stands for Community-Based Action Research and Advocacy. Through her leadership and vision, Oaks has developed a certificate program in critical community engagement, which is a type of service learning that takes seriously understanding, accepting, and celebrating human diversity as we expand our potential to create justice. Professor Lopez will talk about the CARA program. Please help me welcome her. I'm nervous too. Um, ooh, oh, shouldn't have done that. Um, well, thank you, Gina. It's a great honor to be here this evening and a great pleasure to see you, Dr. Blake. Um, it's a great honor to, uh, to speak to you all about something I care deeply about, which is community engagement here at Oaks College. In a very important way, Dr. Blake and his work was the inspiration for the current version of this program. I feel so lucky to have met you and like so many to have learned from you. And I'm so glad that the Provost House will now have your name. Um, I met Dr. Blake in the process of the Oaks Oral History Project in 2013-14. We called this project Building the Strength to Love and Dream after Robin D.G. Kelly's essay by a similar name. Uh, students read your comments to faculty in 1972, that's how the course started, and then existing Oaks oral history transcripts. They studied the historical context of the era, and then they designed, conducted, and transcribed in-depth interviews with people who had been, Oaks, been at Oaks in the past. It was this project that taught me the importance of namesakes. The students were totally awed that all of that had happened here, in this very place where they were living and studying. They wrote and talked about the sense of depth and purpose and orientation that this knowledge of presence had given them. They felt more grounded, oriented, and mature, able to speak to adults after this experience. In particular, they appreciated knowing that Oaks has always been a place with a mission for justice and that people before them had struggled to make it happen. This gave them not only a sense of belonging, but a sense of strength that they could draw on greater than themselves or their family of origin. And as, they, and as published authors, they became convinced that it was their job to go out and teach other people, to spread their newfound awareness. This showed me what my purpose was. The program that would become CARA community-based action research and advocacy needed to support this transformative critical effect no matter what the curricular content or placement site may be. Another thing that was unforgettable and valuable from the Oaks Oral History Project was students' tone of pain and accusation as they said over and over again in these two years, why didn't anyone ever tell us this? And this led in many ways to a process of recovering a lot of those photos and a lot of those oral histories and um, to a rediscovery uh, throughout the college of what, what that struggle has been and what that history has been. But of course, it's our job to tell students this. Every day, we need to tell them the history of what has, become, what has come before them, what people thought they were doing, and then with them create new purposes that relate to them and the arc of their lives. I came to understand that our work here at Oaks requires a special kind of daily rededication Every day we have to reinvest our space with purpose and community, to rebuild power, to resist the forces of alienation, oppression, and entropy that seem to get stronger each day. But we can only do so much telling per minute. 
and we all need help. So we draw on our namesakes, on the photos, on the stories of others who have faced strong challenges and move forward in the service of others. I have often thought of the story you tell Dr. Blake about when you were a child and used to help the elders in your community by reading to them and letter writing for them. This inspired me to include a new question for applicants to the Corralavos after school program that we run with students in team teaching. We ask these applicants, what does the term service ethic mean to you and how have you learned about it in your life? Many students tell about what they've learned from their parents, what that looked like in their childhood. And some students, even with nudging and a little bit of help, cannot conjure what this might mean. And that's how we know the shape of our cohort and the shape of our work. I'd like to tell you all about the work that we do and the new community projects that we're developing in the CARA program, like the Storytellers for Justice program that's just happening this year. Is Mark here? Dang, okay. Um, and the Puentes Legal Aid Clinic. But I want to take just a minute to draw on another legacy that Dr. Blake has left with Oaks College, which is to recognize who is not here in this room with us, besides Mark. Um, <laughs> sorry. It's actually a very serious uh, legacy. Um, I wonder if you can picture the children and youth of Santa Cruz out there who are made to feel they do not belong here. Maybe they are treated like burdens or problem cases at their schools because of the station of life they were born into, or the color of their skin, or the language they speak at home, or the place that their parents came from. I'm thinking of someone right now, who I know well, who is homeless, who is waiting for our county to open up some beds and services for youth and who would be stunned to see the affluence of this place that we're in right now. I think of their parents who are humiliated and grieving because they are deprived of the, of the right to help their children. We have so much wisdom and so many educational resources in this place, and yet we lack somehow the means to channel them beyond our gate. We would love to place our students outside Santa Cruz in field studies. We need more of this. We need the tools, the hope, and the energy, and the networks that this could bring us. But meanwhile, right now, day after day, week after week, here in service learning at Oaks, the work is actually right here at home, rededicating the purpose of our university and our college, remembering who our community is, and building the strength to keep on keeping on with love and dreams of justice. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. It is my distinct honor and privilege to introduce Dr. J. Herman Blake. As you all know, Dr. Blake is the founding provost of Oaks College. He was also a first-generation college student raised by his mom, Lila C. Blake. Dr. Blake came to UCSC in 1966 and was a first black professor on the campus. At the time, he was a professor in the sociology department. Dr. Blake and Dr. Ralph Guzman worked together to set the direction of the college, but it was Dr. Blake who was responsible for implementing that vision as provost. He worked tirelessly to create a space that could take up the deep and necessary work of understanding difference and similarities across social groups with an emphasis on starting a college where students of color and first-generation college students could thrive. This work must have been especially challenging given that UCSC had a vast majority of white middle-class students at the time. As the Oaks Provost, Dr. Blake created community engagement opportunities for students in Alameda County, Contra Costa County, and my home county, Stanislaus. These programs also opened pathways for recruitment and many students from these regions graduated from Oaks College. At, at alumni events now, I hear so much about the impact and influence that Dr. Blake had on his students' lives. He helped set the course and direction for so many then and continues to do so today at Oaks, thanks to the legacy that he has created. And Dr. Blake will now share his comments with us. 
Please join me in welcoming him. First of all, I want to say thank you to all of you for being here. I can't tell you how gratified I am. And it really brings tears to my eyes as I sit and listen, as I visit with you, and I remember previous times. I want to particularly express gratitude and thanks to my two daughters who are here tonight, Audris, whom you heard speak, and who sacrificed a lot so that I could do what I did. And you have to understand that she grew beyond all of that. And she lives in the spirit of my mother, Lilas Blake. And there's another child here who doesn't say much, but when she gets at a piano with her fingers, she speaks eloquently. And we have always enjoyed her music and her spirit. And that's my daughter, Vanessa. I don't know where Vanessa is in this audience. Oh, there you are. <laughs> if you ever see Vanessa with the rest of us, she'll always tell you. She may be the shortest, but she's the firstborn. <laughs> and she takes charge. She really does. And I'm grateful to her for being here. She came from Portland, Oregon. And I, I thank you, Vanessa and Audris, for allowing me to be who I could be as we built this wonderful college. Thank you both. I could tell stories about them, uh, but I, I won't. Uh, I really won't. I, I would have to pay another price. <laughs> but I want to take a moment and reflect on this experience uh, perhaps in some ways that may be unique, some ways maybe not so. First of all, I want to correct. Well, first of all, I want to salute the spirit of Rafael Guzman. Because Rafael was everything that we came to know and understand and a lot more. And as I would sit with him on the deck of his house up in Bonnie Dune and the sun would be shining and we would be talking about our dreams. You know, we never knew it could happen because we never even chaired a department. And here they say, build a college. So Ralph and I had these dreams and we continued to pursue them. But I wanna say a word about some others here. Now, Bill Doyle, and I want to correct you, Chan, uh, Provost, you said he was the first white man to join our group. Bill was never white. <laughs> Bill Doyle was Bill Doyle. He was never white. And if you could ever understand what I mean, you would know why we did what we did, okay? I used to fight with Paige Smith in Cowell College. I came in here, uh, Paige was great, but he had some crazy ideas. <laughs> and he thought he could just send students out in the community and they could study the community and come back and write about the community. And my question is, well, what does the community get out of it? Paige didn't think about that. And it was a conflict, but not, not hostility, but the debate between Paige and I that led to these community service programs. And we call it the Extramural Education and Community Service Program. The education was extramural by students being in the community. And the communities got the services of very talented young people. So I'm saying Bill was never white. When I would have those battles with Paige Smith, every now and then I'd get a little handwritten note. And the handwritten note would say, you know, you just continue. I didn't know this guy. 
I just knew he was priceless in that way. And when we approached him, Bill Doyle said something to Ralph and I that, that, that shocked me. He said, I have to go ask and talk about it with my wife. <laughs> you know, yeah, that's right. <laughs> wife? Well, you got to meet Glennie. And if you ever have a chance to sit in his home with his wife, who was unable to be with us this evening, you would understand that high school romance is still flourishing and alive. And Bill is here with his daughter, Mary, who made it possible for him to be here because Glennie couldn't be with us. But as soon as we hit town, we went to see Bill and Glennie, and we had a wonderful lunch of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. <laughs> It was great. And he taught me about wife. And I'm so grateful I got now an incredible person at my side for the last 20 years who I could talk about, but I won't. George made reference to Roberto Cresby and others who helped us build the college, began to shape it. It was also Dilip Basu, with whom I used to argue back and forth about nonviolence. He approached the issue of nonviolence from his Indian background and his studies of Mahatma Gandhi. I had a different view, and we decided the way to do it was teach a course together. And we taught a course that we organized called Violence and Nonviolence in Social Change. And it was very exciting. I still run into people who say it was a very exciting course for them. We did do some wonderful things. But I want to say a little bit more about Bill and about George. We said in these planning committees, Ralph and I, we really wanted our students to study the sciences. We spent too much time driving up and down Highway 33 in the San Joaquin Valley, in little Latino communities. I was a consultant evaluating poverty programs, and Rafael was doing his work there. And we knew people had too many expectations and desires and hopes. So I talked about science. Do you know it was Bill who told us how to do it? Bill said in his calm way, you know, we scientists have never been able to teach in the college because the facilities all have to be centralized for economic purposes. His suggestion, along with us running into the program we did at St. Andrews Presbyterian College in Laurenburg, North Carolina, showed us how it could be done. So we took Bill and George, Ron Softly, and a couple of others, and we went to Laurenburg, North Carolina. We saw that center, and it was a model. It was a model. And then we went from there, as George pointed out, went to Johns Island, South Carolina, where my daddy lived. And we stayed with him for a few hours, back up in the woods in the country. And then on to Penn Center on St. Helena Island, and Kathy Huey, who was here tonight, lives now on, Penn, on St. Helena Island in retirement. But she got there through that program. And uh, then we went on to Defusky Island. And we did walk Defusky, because the only other way to get around was on a ride a cow. And I, none of us could do that. So we walked those long roads up to see the slave huts. Remember? And on the way back, we ran across a local resident who had the most interesting name, Honky. And Honky was doing what Honky did as a Sea Island resident. And we looked and we learned. And I want to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, George Blumenthal is probably the only astrophysicist <laughs> in the world who knows how to squinch a squirrel. <laughs> you may not know what squinching a squirrel is, but he does. <laughs> that was a beautiful experience. Then we came back and we continued to build. 
And I just want to mention one other person. They say I shouldn't mention people, you know, and you forget some, and I will, and I apologize. When we had our first commencement, it was outdoors, and we didn't understand. We scheduled it something like 10 o'clock in the morning on a Sunday morning. And the marine layer hit that setting, and the chairs were not sitable. <laughs> and here I came for this commencement, and there's several people here who were in that first class, or at least two people, Celia somewhere, and uh, Susan were in that original class. And out there with towels drying off the chairs, I mean drying off the chairs, faithfully and diligently, was Hal Hyde. The Vice Chancellor for Business and Finance. What hit me was who are these people who would serve so unselfishly and ask for no reward but the excellence and output of our students. One last point about that as we close the circle. We've ultimately recruited three young people from that island, Defusky Island. And you gotta understand it's not connected to the mainland by bridges or anything, even now. I had a little battle, they call it, a little battle boat. It's about maybe half as long as this row here. Yeah. Had a little 25 horsepower engine. And have to go over the open water for about 18 miles to get there. And we went. But we ultimately recruited three young people from that island to come to Oaks College. One of them graduated. And we published an article together about his experience at Oaks. He talks about studying statistics with Marshall Sylvan and how Marshall encouraged him in statistics. I mean, it's in the article. And here's Marshall and that young man, Urban Simmons, is still running the waters, going to work every morning, getting crabs and shrimp that he collects and sells to support the community before he goes to work as a social worker. We have several videos, and I mention all of this because in 20, uh, 2010, the United Nations declared the next 10 years as a special decade for people from minority communities around the world. The I forget the exact term they use, but it was a special decade. And to open that decade, they sent a team to South Carolina where Dr. Moore and I were living. And we hosted that team. And they made two videos which have been shown in over 160 countries sitting there on that island with that same young man demonstrating his community skills, his fishing and hunting skills, but when he sits and talks to them, he demonstrates his Oaks College skills. <laughs> what I'm trying to say is that circle has closed in ways that you would not believe. And I could go on and on and on, and I want to go on and on and on, but I know it's not appropriate. I'll close by once again, saying something about my family. I didn't know I was up here dancing. <laughs> but I did know that some of the songs she used to sing, I really understood the words, even though I didn't pretend to know. But I didn't know she was up here dancing. But those young people, Vanessa and Orgis and Lyle, helped to make that experience very, very real. And we left Oaks, but Oaks never left us. We carried that spirit. And Dr. Moore, who was an extremely accomplished academic, 
She led the faculty at Dillard University in rebuilding Dillard University in New Orleans after the ravages of Hurricane Katrina when the campus was destroyed. She was the one who did it. And we came together trying to understand what I brought and what Audris and Lyle brought as we reached out into community. And we've been doing some things you will find very interesting. Recently, in 2015, we had the terror of a gentleman walking into a church in Charleston and sitting through a prayer meeting. And as they were praying to end the meeting, beginning to shoot. And he killed nine people in that church. Emily and I frequently go to that church and participate in their services. Last year, no, earlier this year, I'm sorry, earlier this year, the pastor of that church approached us and asked us to conduct a series of workshops, a series of workshops with the members working on healing from the pain. Because even though it happened in 2015, they had to go through the pain of seeing the evidence gathered for a trial and go through the pain of a trial. They were in agony for three years, even though it was one evening. And so he came to us and asked us if we would help them with a series of workshops. And we did from the spirit of what we learned from George, Bill, Hal, Ron, and so many others. We sat right up until May, working with people, sitting in workshops, listening to them talk talk about how they couldn't even go back to the church to worship because when they went in, they were walking into a crime scene. Memory. But we did. We were reasonably successful. And as we were coming out here, we learned about Pittsburgh and the Tree of Life Synagogue. And we cried as we thought about what they're dealing with. And this morning when we turned on our computers and got our email, we got a message indicating that the pastor who came to us asking us to help his congregation heal was on his way to Pittsburgh. What I'm trying to stress is you may think in individual or singular terms, but the consequences are broad. One story I forgot, but I got to tell it. Not too long ago, I was helping people in uh, Ridgeland, South Carolina, dealing with some of their land issues, people who didn't know much. And Susan worked in Ridgeland when she was a student on this intern program. Kathy Hubey worked in Beaufort. Julie Chang worked over in Monterey Park Chang. And Julie's here tonight, too, I know. But in dealing with the people, we had to go to a master in equity, sort of like a judge who handles all of these issues. And I walked in with the people, and I looked at the master in equity, and I want to tell you, he looked like a real stereotypical southerner that you don't want to deal with. And he sat there chewing whatever he was chewing and looking. And when they called our case and I went up, he said to me, we always appreciated those students you sent here. And I've never been able to thank you. What I'm trying to say is you just don't know. So in the decade established by the United Nations in all of that, this little place here, and it's not little, is national, international, 
and continues to inspire. And the greatest joy for me is being able to come back here because that is not the provost's house. That's the house of my mama, Lilas Blake. And I want to thank you for giving me this opportunity. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Brian Arau, uh, and I am the Senior Director of College Student Life here at Oaks College. And I'm very pleased uh, to, uh, to adjourn us this evening. Uh, it's quite an honor, both in my professional capacity here at the college, and also as a very proud and very grateful alum of Oaks College. Uh, we want to thank all of you for joining us this evening to celebrate Dr. Blake and his many contributions to Oaks College and uh, through our honoring of him in uh, renaming the Provost House after him. Uh, we also want to thank all of our speakers this evening uh, for sharing uh, for sharing your stories, really. Um, often when you come to an event like this, you don't necessarily get the benefit of such heartfelt, personal, powerful stories. And each of our speakers really share that with us. And so I feel really grateful to have gotten to hear from you and to experience your wisdom in that way. So thank each of you for that. Um, and also want to make sure that we thank the wonderful staff and student volunteers who helped to make this event possible, who set up the room, uh, who have done a lot of things behind the scenes to make sure that this event was a success. So um, thanks to all of them as well. Indeed. Uh, before we leave, I'd like to, uh, to take this opportunity to share some additional exciting news with you, which is that we have recently created what we're calling the J. Herman Blake Community Engagement Fund. Uh, and this is a fund that is going to support the efforts of the Cata program, some of which uh, Dr. Lopez talked with you about a bit earlier this evening. Uh, those incredible service learning programs are so in keeping with the mission of Oaks College and with the vision that Dr. Blake helped to craft um, and really pioneered over the years. And, and as one of the ways that we're continuing to do that great work here at Oaks College. Um, we're, we're really, really uh, fortunate that, uh, that we've gotten off to a great start with this brand new fund. Uh, an anonymous donor has given us a gift of $25,000 uh, to get us started in that fund. Indeed, thank you. Uh, and so if you feel moved to contribute any amount, um, if you got $25,000, that's also great. You can match the, match the gift if you like. But really, again, any amount would, would really, really help us to continue to sustain the really wonderful work uh, of the Cutout program. Um, so uh, we have envelopes in the back. I understand many of you have picked up some of those envelopes already. Um, feel free to ask any of us or any of the folks um, from University Relations if you have questions about how you might contribute to the J. Herman Blake Community Engagement Fund. Um, would, would uh, be honored um, to have your support in the work that we continue to do with students here at Oaks. Uh, so I'm aware that I'm the last thing standing between you and an opportunity perhaps to greet Dr. Blake uh, and enjoy some refreshments. And so uh, with that, again, I'll thank you for your time. Uh, please uh, enjoy uh, refreshments and gathering with us. Uh, and we hope to see you back at our college again very soon. Thank you.